कॉलेजों में क्लिनिकल आस्पेक्ट से नहीं पढ़ाया जाता मैं एक बहुत इम्पॉर्टेंट बात करना चाहूँगा हो चुका है वैसे आ, बस क्योंकि ये ऐसे विषय क्लिनिकली नहीं पढ़ाए जाते हैं सर और भी कोई हमारे गेस्ट हैं इसमें शायद ज्वाइन होने थे आ, वो आ गए हैं सर हाँ आ गए तो उनका माइक उनका कैमरा सर ऑन हो जाता तो वो स्क्रीन पर दिखते मदन सर कैन यू प्लीज पुट ऑन योर वीडियो कैमरा ऑन कर लीजिए क्योंकि आज आप हमारे साथ वैलिडिटी सेशन के मेहमान हैं यू आर द ओके अब थोड़ा सा कैमरा सर पोजीशन ठीक कर दीजिए नमस्कार नमस्कार सर थैंक यू आई रियली वेलकम डॉक्टर मदन धंडवेलू सर थैंक यू जी नमस्कार ग्रीटिंग्स सर फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई एम अगेन थैंकफुल टू ऑल ऑफ यू ऑल ऑफ आवर स्पीकर्स एज दिस प्रोग्राम इज होस्टेड अंडर द आयुष दर्पण जनरल फेसबुक पेज एंड द यूट्यूब चैनल अंडर द गाइडेंस ऑफ द ग्रेट नाडी गुरु प्रोफेसर संजय छाजेड़ सर एंड सो मैनी इतने लोगों को एक साथ जोड़ना इतने लोगों को सर आपको बताना चाहूँगा आप टू uh, मैं आपको एक मैसेज देना चाहूँगा कि सुबह के दस बजे से लंच ब्रेक भी नहीं हुआ है सर इधर इधर पर लंच ब्रेक नहीं हुआ है इधर चल ही रहा है सर कार्यक्रम और सात बजे तक हम कंक्लूड करेंगे सर क्योंकि सात बजे के बाद एक कार्यक्रम और है तो सात बजे तक हमारा वैलिडिटी सेशन है मैं फिर से कमान संजय छाजेड़ सर को सौंपता हूँ गुड गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी इट इज वंडरफुल फीलिंग टू हैव बीन अ पार्ट ऑफ सच अ ग्रैंड एंड मेगा वेबिनार ऑन द सब्जेक्ट द लिस्ट सब्जेक्ट ऑफ पल्स डायग्नोसिस वी हैव विथ अस टुडे डॉक्टर वनिता शर्मा फ्रॉम ऑस्ट्रेलिया द वन ऑफ देयर वेरी रिनोन्ड आयुर्वेदिक फिजिशियन फ्रॉम मेलबोर्न एंड वी हैव विथ अस डॉक्टर मदन थंगावेलु सर अ एग्रीकल्चरिस्ट बाय क्वालिफिकेशन and genetic expert by research and an ayurveda expert by practice he has been very pivotal in spreading classical ayurveda across europe and it is it is going to be a fantastic phenomena to listen to you both stalwarts who have taken ayurveda to international levels and given all of us an opportunity to be a part of global community of healthcare specialist and provide our small services to the global people it is all because of you sirs and madam please i request vanita madam to give us her words of wisdom thank you very much please thank you so much um, sanjay sir and my uh, deep respect like uh, to all the speakers like who actually um uh, expanded their knowledge like and uh, shared with uh, uh, such a vast and diverse community uh, especially like uh, yourself uh, um Uh, like um, you had been working uh, since morning i know like and uh, navin sir like uh, you really had been working hard like um, uh, uh, since morning uh, because um, uh, there was like uh, so many uh, speakers like it's not a easy task to actually um, um, organize like all this and and uh, i uh, would just put my preview and my um uh, namaste and uh, um just deep respect to uh, professor madan madan ji as well and uh, navin joshi ji sanjay sir um and all the uh, respective speakers like uh, for today uh, for whatever and however they uh, sort of like uh, shared their knowledge and um what i would do is like a, i'll run a bit of like slide show and quick uh, um thank you so yeah so i'm going to talk about the relevance and the clinical significance of uh, nadi parikshan um in the traditional sciences and in uh, uh like uh, in ayurveda uh, which is our indian legacy uh, so i have been practicing like uh, in melbourne for last uh, 22 years and my personal um experience and 
I'm uh, quite like known mainly for the Nadi Parikshan and uh, and as a pulse diagnosis specialist, uh, as well as the Panchakarma specialist. That's what I'm specialized in the area. Uh, so um, I just like uh, I want to share like how it all evolved and and uh, where it started from uh, the pulse. Like because I had been hearing to all the other speakers like and uh, looking at their expertise, like how they shared, how it all started, and uh, everything talking about um, what relevance like and uh, significance the pulse is um, in the traditional ways. But there is a lot of uh, um, modern aspect to it like now as well. And there is a lot of uh, uh, clinical research is happening as well. Uh, but I would start from the evolution of our knowledge uh, of arterial pulse in the age of discovery from where it actually started was like uh, uh, from the Greek medicine uh, that began from the 15th century like uh, and, and uh, went until uh, end of like 18th century. So the Western medical science basically inherited a lot of existing ideas from this antiquity of the medical science, like traces its roots directly to the Greeks, but the epic poems like the Odyssey are offer like insight on the ancient medical practices before the time of like Hippocrates. So the recurrent theme in the poem is that God, if displeased, send plagues and epidemics and illnesses to the humanity, what we are facing in today's world, like uh, with all these like um, pandemics and epidemics that are happening. And uh, historians like have mentioned that the medieval world valued the sanctity of uh, 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 sanctity of um, church. Um, then actually the Western uh, approach, the philosophers, doctors like Aristotle, Hippocrates and Evichina used pulse um, for variations in the health and disease to assess the patient. So it started like long ago, um, even when uh, there wasn't even a mention um, of um, pulse in Ayurvedic history. So then it spread it across to the Arab Islamic medicine in the from the 8th century till 14th century it was there so the islamic medicine is the one actually who preserved and systemized and developed this medical knowledge of um, classical antiquity we call as pulse including those of hippocrates uh, dioscorides uh, it integrated concepts of the ancient Greek, Roman, Persian, and the Indian traditions of Ayurveda. So um, they were called like the pulse uh, uh, diagnosticians, um, the Hippocrates, Aristotle, Erastitratus, Galen, and Avicina was the main one um, who actually uh, sort of uh, evolved this um, uh, examination of the pulse called pulsology. So Evichina um, first wrote um, that he, uh, the pulse is like feeling the pulse is trickier, which can be used for the person who is in love sickness, basically, and uh, which relates to the emotional state um, of the people. And the first to describe the pulse in health and disease was Gallen. Um, but after uh, like refining all these like theories, the gallon theories on the pulse and the correct explanation of uh, pulse was like more to be called as a pulsation in the words of like Evichina, every um, uh, pulse like comprises of two moments and two pauses. So thus expansion, pause, expansion, pause. So uh, that's how he defined the pulses. And in ancient times, Galen, as well as the Chinese physician, enormously used pulse was the only uh, unique type of pulse for every organ of the body and every disease. They, um, uh, the Chinese physicians used to use this as a main diagnostic tool. And uh, uh, Evichina examined the pulse using the wrist. And this is still being used till date. And uh, this was the um, uh, pathy that actually continued um, till date. But uh, in between, even though the Chinese were considered the great masters in pulse diagnosis, but even the classical antiquity used the pulse in health 
and disease to guide them in assessing the condition, um, medical conditions or anything. And Evichina discusses pulse diagnosis extensively in his book, like Canon of Medicine. Um, and he said that Evichina uh, studied the Chinese system of pulse diagnosis and based his um, uh, theory and in his treatise on the pulse, uh, which he called it as Rizolai Nabzia, Evichina said like, pulse may be of a different shape like uh, and a twindle shape to sh shock like long trembling short small slow and soft increase nervous um uh, and and empty so um uh, the pulse was assessed not only in terms of whether it was weak or strong slow irregular but also for example whether it was large or small and hard or soft the physicians considered that they would identify problems ranging from dropsy, diphtheria, pregnancy, and anxiety. Oh, right. So, um, uh, just uh, wait a minute. Can you have a glass of water? Yes. Uh, so, the pulse diagnosis, like I had uh, um, a six, they mentioned in Chinese, like as six positions and three levels, which is uh, Kun Guan um, Chi. And uh, then uh, there was like all these based on the meridians, basic five elements and uh, quite a lot of description, which has been already given by a lot of other um, uh, speakers. And then uh, the important assessment um, uh, was like the health of the key in general and the relationship of yin and yang and relative state of deficiency and uh, excess, like whether an exterior pathogen is present. So with Ayurvedic pulse, like uh, we all understand, we look at Vata, Pitta, Kapha, and uh, it should, uh, when it should be checked and what's, what it is uh, at the superficial uh, touch and what it is at the deep touch. And then accuracy of pulse examination uh, depends on the factors, the awareness of the individual and to understand and interpret the subtle nature of the vibrations. So um, uh, there is uh, the proficiency of Nadi Pariksha is gained by alertness and long clinical practice and mentor. So there is a lot of like a, uh, that uh, uh, reference to the vital flow of life or energy, which passages the channels of circulation all over the body. And uh, uh, so uh, taking Nadi is more than counting the beats so the health and functioning of the whole mind-body constitution is determined basically on the balance of these three biological humors. So uh, it's largely based on the pulse examination and it reveals the physical characteristics of the pulse and are interpreted uh, along with prognosis, which gives the understanding of the underlying cause. So uh, there is in modern terminology now a relation with sphygmology in the pulse, like so, um, and uh, uh, there is a lot of like present scientific studies that certainly give a new light of hope in the direction and advancement of Ayurvedic pulse lore and a good asset to this science. So um, we uh, basically, there were clearly defined methods of pulse diagnosis in the traditional medicines that can lead to reason well-defined syndrome determination. And um, um, that's what the significance of pulse diagnosis in modern or ancient times. Can you diagnose accurately or advent of advanced technological medical diagnostics? Or should it, its use be limited to confirm diagnosis? Does the pulse diagnosis add the critical information? Is the training in pulse diagnosis quite limited? Do you need any experienced practitioner to check um, and uh, its relation to the quantum physics and Eastern uh, philosophy, like who knows? Um, what's the basic stuff everything made of, relation between the parts and the whole, and how the objects and the properties emerge, or role and locus of humans, like so a major paradigm change may change the rules, um, raise up new questions, categories and distinctions, maybe old controversies between science and humanities, Western and Eastern thought just disappear. So basically the reality is not mechanical, there is a room for the activity of consciousness in human beings. So the quantum physics might be used to describe the formation of material and matter and the mental phenomena. So the mental states need not to be identified with brain states and allows known local um, connections. So yeah, so there is a lot of interpretation and 
uh, Eastern ideas, like um, uh, towards idealism and parallels and similarities, like mysticism. So uh, it provides, like Indian philosophy provides the realistic ideas concerning between interplay between the consciousness and the matter. So um, there is a plurality that emerges from immutable basis and the consciousness and um, uh, Humans are conscious, like uh, evolving beings who are embedded into the corporal, uh, corporeal layers of nature. And there is a lot of uh, evidence and um, a study being done between relation between the mind, matter, and consciousness in Indian philosophy, talking about Sankhya, Vedanta, Tantra, and uh, important frameworks to produce like uh, mental technologies. And um, uh, so when we talk about Sankhya, we know that enumeration, the evolution of consciousness into the material nature. And we talk about all those 24 tattvas and uh, uh, the Purusha, the Prakriti, Manas, like Buddhi, um, Ankar, Sattva Rajtam, and, and um, uh, the Brahma. So basically the flow of consciousness and the pulse, like how it's all associated, like the Prakriti is basically the absolute nature and the Purusha is the matter. So the potentiality that exists within the Purusha high consciousness. So it's the Mahatha is transcendental celestial intelligence and Ankar is the feeling of I am in every organism and the pulse is the individual psychophysiology and a flow of consciousness represented by the three doshas. So, yeah, so that's all about consciousness um, and its role in nature. So material aspect, conscious aspect, realm of life. And talk about Ida Pingla and Nadi, about like 72,000 Nadis are there. Like, so uh, we just like uh, look at the right nostril Pingla and left Ida and the middle one is the Sushumna. So we relate the pulse with the celestial elements like and... Uh, there is a lot of like variation between the Nari um, with the modern concept, like we are uh, getting to a point where there could be a lot of like more scientific study could be done relating the pulsation and and even with the, with the modern doctors are now accepting this. So um, that's my um, like a uh, talk about like just introducing like how um, there is a lot of like a, a significance about uh, the pulse like for the diagnosis and assessment, uh, not only in the traditional way, but a lot of like diseases and organs, like uh, even in my practical life, like uh, in my clinic, I have uh, assessed a lot of uh, clients like and have diagnosed their thyroid conditions or uh, ladies who are pregnant like in the third month uh, after assessing I can tell without any scanning like whether it's a boy or a girl like a lot of things that I uh, inherited even uh, from my family like I'm the fifth generation in the family but I learned from my grandfather and uh, uh, but I think like uh, um, there is a lot of like relevance and and a lot of uh, uh, yearly timely practice that actually uh, takes you uh, to develop that expertise. So you have to um, basically go through a lot of like uh, different hands and different people, your family, starting with your family, yourself, and then uh, getting it out like into the clients. Like So that's all I wanted to say. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Sanjayji and uh, Navindi for giving me opportunity to be um, speaking um, today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It was a wonderful journey of the history of pulse diagnosis. I really appreciate that it has been well accepted fact that these pulsating organs in the body had ever been since the humanity has arrived on this planet. It was accepted that there is some relationship of these pulsating organs and the life. And this was their time immemorial, not only in the Greek medicines, but also in the Indian context also. The similar phenomena has been observed in the Vedas, right from Rig Veda. It is seen in Charka. We normally feel that Charka has not said anything about uh, pulse in yes. specificity, but it is not so. The Indriya Sthana has specifically been devoted to those elements which are for the investigations. And if you recall, 
the setting of the indriya sthana is prior to nidana sthana and that yes. gives you an understanding in that understanding of how the options are to be used the third adhyaya of indriya uh, indriya sthana gives you very specificity of the tactile elements and in there they categorically said even charaka has mentioned that if mandyagata spandanam aspandanam parasuriti vidya if the pulsating factor in the uh, neck and then when chakrapet it said it's on the gala parshwa that is my carotid and even today if something happens in emergency the first pulse which is observed is carotid yes as one who was aware about the carotid and its functioning and its relationship with the light can he not give any specification about pulse he has given the pulsation and its entire impact on the pulse diagnosis but as indian traditions are everything written in a uh, coded form so yes. we have to decode it and the first try of decoding was done in sarangara 11th century yes, yes. galen and prior to galen there are certain references and those were prominent till 17th century in modern medical science but yes. after 17th century after the advent of the various gadgets this pulse diagnosis has lost its own stature in the western yes. medicine Uh, yes. because now the pulse has gone to the nurses not to the doctors and we at india has preserved that particular knowledge and tried to develop it in a better sense i am very thankful to remind us about the, all the toe tension would have been more happy if you would have shared some of your thoughts of the traditional family knowledge you have gathered here but thank you very much for what you have shared i may request uh, dr thangavelu sir to provide us with his wisdom thank you namaskar ji can you Please. i hope you can hear me clearly yes we can thank you sir now greetings to all of you from the university town of cambridge uh old university town we are celebrating many centuries 800 years plus and i take this opportunity to thank Uh, sanjay ji sanjay ji is very special to us and uh, we are feel honored to be connected with sanjay ji doing this amazing thing also my special thanks to navin joshi ji for bringing us all together here on this platform now thank you again for giving me the chance to be at the very tail end of this session because it's given me an overview of all the presentations and while going through this i was just preparing a few thoughts and what i found uh quite surprising is that my slides which i had prepared independently of all the discussions they come very correctly at the right time so i hope when i go through the slide it will resonate particularly with sanjay ji's comments made just now and i want to highlight one or two yes, points sir, here i want to number one highlight why this is important why this initiative is important i've been discussing with sanjay ji about extending this initiative to form much larger network across the world so i want to spend a little time on that number two i wish to spend a little time looking at that foundations which is the deeper foundations where does this knowledge and this desire and this understanding where does it come from and why are we revisiting it now i want to give a little bit about that and the third point i hope i can convey while i'm talking is about where we should go the future signs for this stuff. this is very important is there anything known in physics the physics that we know uh this town where i am seated is very special because this is the home we feel the home of many many aspects of fundamental physics this was where the electron was discovered this is where prior to the discovery of the electron james clerk maxwell gave us these the whole theory of electromagnetism this is the town where dna evolved the whole structure of dna was solved here and sitting here it feels a great honor to be drawn into a discussion of a phenomenon that is being used 
routinely in practice, like uh, Vinita Ji, or like uh, um, we had a lovely contribution by Ishan Ji, you know, the clarity that is given there. The beauty of how he explains everything in Hindi, which is derived from Sanskrit, and the elegance of the science that comes through that is lost when we translate things. So before I set off point number one, I wish to do my presentation in English, if I may. Hamari Hindi thoda kamzor hai. Baatcheet mein to chalta hai. Magar is type ki jo detailed explanations jahan chahiye, us mein agar angrezi mein kar sakte hai, thoda asana. Please, please, you can definitely, sir. Thank you. And I start by saying, why are we in this position? Why this excitement? Why are we excited about visiting ancient Indian sciences? Here in the UK, the UK Parliament, we have something called the All Party Parliamentary Group for Indian Traditional Sciences. This is, might be the only parliament in the whole world where we have a parliamentary group discussing India's traditional sciences. As far as I know, even the Indian parliament does not have a group. Uh, you will find the details in our parliamentary group website. We have lords and baronesses and members of parliament who come together and we discuss all these things. So we feel the wealth of knowledge in the Indian systems is so rich and deep we feel it must come and become part of mainstream science. So that is point number one, that we in UK, in the parliament, we have a group. And we are inspired by what is happening in India, and we are following this very closely, and we want to bring it into the mainstream. And what is that mainstream? I will switch to my slides to give you an idea of where this mainstream is and why this excitement about India's traditional sciences. Another point I want to mention before I go to my slides is that in April, two years ago, April 2018, Prime Minister Modi came to the Commonwealth Leaders Summit here in the UK. And together with, the, uh, with His Highness Prince uh, uh, Charles, they unveiled a wish to have the first center of excellence. We call it ACE, ACE, for Ayurveda Center of Excellence and the Center for Traditional Sciences. So that wish has already been presented to the community. And we not only have an all party parliamentary group, we also have a wish to desire, uh, a wish to develop. Uh, Ayurveda Center of Excellence here in the UK. It might be the first one in the world once again. Sorry if we are ahead of India, but this is our wish. So it is within this context that we are doing, uh, that I'm going to present uh, here. Now, um, if, can I share my slide? Please, uh, share please, my screen. you can share okay. it. Okay. This is where we are with in health sciences. So up here is an annual event that happens in Austria in a place called Gastan. And the theme for this year's event is the, it's, it's a very interesting provocative title, Dancing with Elephants, a new partnership for health, democracy and business. And it's a very provocative title, which has hidden within it a deep message. It's left to you to imagine who these elephants are and what is this dance that is happening with the elephants. But what is clear is that there is a call for a new partnership for health, democracy, and businesses. There is a feeling that things are not going correctly in the world something is wrong. And this touches also the world of health. You can see details of this event and you can register at this event at this website. This is an annual event where the thought leaders in health come together. 
The other big change and the thinking that is going on is this United Nations development goals. We feel there is a lot, people who feel there is a lot wrong with the world today. And uh, they have distilled this into 17 goals. This is, this is the 17 goals that they want to achieve. And in here, you will find many, many important indicators that are relevant to what we are discussing in terms of sciences, traditional sciences, in terms of reviving these traditional sciences, in terms of health. Uh, there are many, many aspects, education, health, teaching, new skills to people, whether it is from contemporary science or whether it's from the ancient sciences. We want to educate people and we want to teach them how to live in this world in sustainable ways. So all these points are top on the minds of policymakers everywhere in the world, especially the leading economies of the world. And this must be the case also in, in India. Now, we have reached a time in the history of this uh, world where we are facing an unprecedented crisis, infections. Can we turn this around? Can health instead of viruses become that infection? And I feel we can. And this challenge is distilled in this whole term called health. Health is understood most elegantly in the Indian systems. And we are saying in the past few decades, we have seen a overgrowth of this thing called health care. It has become a business, a very lucrative business, a very dangerous business, and a very lethal business. Can we shift it away towards well-being? Well-being is described best in the Indian systems. We have minds going from the time of Buddha, 600 BC or before, all the way to Nagarjuna, in, a thousand years later, the second Buddha, who talks about the Panchadasha Prakara, the 15 signs of health and well being. Can this be brought into our discussions to show that there is something called health? It is available to all. And how can we make this shift from where we are today, which is called healthcare, which in fact is the commoditization of disease to well-being, which is also, I want to use the word commoditization because many people understand only phrases like this, I call the commoditization of health. What would it look like? It would look like the reestablishment of health. We must learn how to measure and audit health learn how to use this to prevent disease. And much of what we are doing today in this wonderful session, the second session that Sanjay Ji has hosted, is showing us how to quantitate, how to measure, how to audit health by taking a simple Nadi measurement, we are measuring health. And can we turn this into a new way of thinking, a new way of thinking about health and well-being? When we look at the larger Europe and the European Union, there is a shift. There is a doctor who is the new president of the European Union, uh, European Commission, uh, Frau von der Leyen. A German lady, a German doctor, a German MD, a mother of seven, who seems to have so much energy. She's in charge of the president of the European Commission. And this is her call. This is in terms of COVID-19. We will stop nothing to save lives. And this is her call for the future of health and health care. There are discussions going on in Parliament. The next six-year program and the funding for the Parliament is scheduled to begin the 1st of January next year. Monies have been allocated for the budgets. The discussions are going on. Not a large amount of money compared to what is spent for health care, the expensive health care. But these are monies that have to be used in certain ways. And one of the calls is 
promotion of disease, promote, uh, promotion of health, prevention of disease, and healthy lifestyle. These are all messages coming very firmly established in Ayurveda, but those discussions don't happen here for whatever reason, maybe distance, maybe ignorance, maybe lack of knowledge about our systems. But I feel these are things that Europe is ready for and will be reaching out to places like India and to scholars and practitioners like yourself to come and teach people in Europe how to look at health differently. So this is setting the background for uh, where we are, at least starting 2021 for the six years, there'll be some funding, there'll be things, and we should see how to open dialogues with researchers. Now for the second part of my talk, which is taking us closer to the discussion today. I've put three figures here, and I use these figures to explain the challenges of the systems of medicine when we have to explain it to people who don't understand the Indian systems. So there are people here who have trained uh, in Cambridge. We have uh, um, a clinical school where students are taught medicine. But if I take any of the students and ask them, do you know anything about Nadis? They wouldn't know anything. Would you know about Ravi Shankar? They will all know something about Ravi Shankar. Do you know this person whose name Bolt? Everybody knows about it. And then I use this example to start the discussion. I say, well, here is a man who holds, he's the fastest man alive. He runs 100 meters at under 10 seconds. And all the young students watch this. They have seen him run. They agree with this. They all know a little bit of music and they all agree with this. And when I tell them that in India, this is how we understand the human body. In the ancient times, we knew how to divide the human body into these kind of geographic patterns of the human body. And they are not happy to accept this. They don't accept that there is something here. There is another way to understand the body, but they're quite happy to accept all this. So there is a bit of a problem here. There's a gap in the transitioning of knowledge. There is, they're happy to understand these things, but not happy to understand these things. I then tell them, how many of you can run 100 meters? And in today's, when I go into a classroom today, there are a lot of children who will not be able to run 100 meters nonstop. They have all come to study medicine. If I ask them, can you run 100 meters nonstop, there are many students there who will not. They cannot. They are just built that way. They haven't trained. They are not physically active. And they cannot. But they are willing to agree that there is somebody in the world who runs at under 10 seconds. The same with Ravi Shankar. And I say, you play the piano. You heard of the sitar, you heard of this man. Can you play the sitar? No. But you are happy to accept that there is somebody who plays the sitar. Yes. Now I move to the one on the left. How come you have a problem with this? There are people in India who do pulse diagnosis and can understand everything about you. What is the reason you can't understand this? Uh, so. There is a problem, and this is the problem we must try and resolve and what we should overcome. Now, for us in India, when we go to different parts of India, this is what we see. This is ancient knowledge. This is Indian traditional science. I have shown on the left hand the position of stellar bodies in the sky, 7.58 p.m. on the 4th of April, 2024, about four years' time from now. This is how objects are going to be positioned in the sky. For me, this is very important. This is a macroscopic representation, a macroscopic representation of something else in the manifest universe. I will leave this to a side for a moment 
and move to what I have on the right hand side. This is representation of the music, the ragas in the southern India, in the Carnatic music system. This representation was given to us fairly relatively recently, and it's very mathematical. It's mathematical in that it takes a given space, and just like we have on the left-hand side, where you've taken a given space that we see, and it is divided symmetrically into sections, and different notes are assigned to different sections, and you get an almost mathematical presentation of systems of music. One can see parallels in these two systems. Now I'll leave this aside and move on to the next slide. The mathematics that is used for representing this space for me is no different from the mathematics used in explaining the human body. Um, we say uh, desha, the concept of desha, which is understood in Ayurveda. Um, deha desha is this. We have a way to understand space. We have a way to understand the human body and the divisions. And there is a not a subtle, but a frank connection between how the body is represented here and how music is set out, or for that matter, how we build houses, how we build temples, how we go about dividing space to make it useful. And much of this knowledge is based on our darshanas. So the two darshanas that are extremely important for us in this space that we are talking about, number one is Sankhya, and number two is Vaisheshika. Now, for me, I'm not a practitioner, I'm not an Ayurveda practitioner, but for me, the beauty of Ayurveda and the beauty of what you are doing today, I appreciate through the eyes of Sankhya and Vaisheshika. And for me, it is completely clear how these two, with as little as these two darshanas, maybe with a little bit of yoga, uh, Kapila uh, uh, Sankhya Sutras, uh, Kannada's Vaisheshika Sutras, Sutras, and um, uh, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. When we put all of this together, all this forms a logical, consistent body uh, of how we divide space, how we do, wherever that space is. I highlight here the term avyakt. I want to come back to this towards the end. I'll come back to this. But the clarity that is offered in our darshan, as particularly Sankhya, takes you back to understanding the dynamics of even the unmanifest. This is very important because there is no other body of knowledge and the systems, system of philosophy that helps you appreciate this dynamic unmanifest, the object. This term is so important for all of us in this space, particularly those who want to see the bridging of Western systems, Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy. Um, uh, Venitaji mentioned very briefly about the, the, where those parallels are. And Venitaji also mentioned about this Shushma, uh, Shushma and the Ida and the Pingala and how it all comes out. Now, all of these are very important. How did our ancients understand these things? And for me, this is the mysterious thing. For me, doing Nadi Paricha is not a mystery because I understand it can be done. But how did they go on to divide and make these kind of divisions? You know, the Shiva Samhita talks about 35,000 Nadis in the human body. You can divide it into so many little, little, little aspects of the human body. So that is my second bit. Now, 
I come to the third part of my presentation, which is why is this important? How, how and how does it connect with modern biology? And where is it that we want to form these bridges? And where do we want to make the bridges? And where do we guide future research based on this thinking that comes, that is rich in our system, and a way of thinking that is rich in the Western systems? How can we bring these two together? Now, these look like very dense and busy images, but shown on the left is the schematic on how you make the human body and all the different cell types from the zygote, from as little as one cell. And all of us begin our life from one cell, a few microns across, and that entire logic is played out. Ayurveda talks about prakriti, and prakriti is such a fascinating concept with six aspects which contribute to formation of assigning pregnancy. I'm a DNA biologist. I look at only the two concepts, the contribution of DNA from the father and the mother, and maybe a little bit of the epigenetics. Ayurveda's pregnancy concept puts three other dimensions into this, which is phenomenal. And we might be reaching a point in modern biology where we will have to look at other attributes to understand these aspects. Now, there is a lot of technology that is available now. If you look at this link here, you will have access to this paper and all these uh, images uh, and all the work that's being done to understand the human body, to understand the human body in terms of links between the organs, in terms of neurophysiology, how do all these things come about? And they are being analyzed at the finest resolution. What we are seeing at the finest resolution when we look at these dynamic processes that happen to form an embryo is that there is something more than what genes and proteins and cells can explain. There is a need to understand something more, not just the electrical circuits and the electrical fields around each cell, there is a deeper logic. Now, I want to uh, dwell a moment on some of these figures. Perhaps it will be seen clearer in the next slide. Now, shown here is how a uh, embryo forms. Now, for me, when I looked at it early on in my life, when I was just deeply involved only in biology and DNA, and these did not make sense. But when I revisit these images through the eyes of Panjabhuta Siddhanta, everything takes on an even more uh, colorful uh, explanation of how thousands of cells suddenly find the logic from the gel booth, how space is compartmentalized, how space is divided into finer units, how cells interact based on the logic offered by Sankhya, how structures evolve. All this takes on a whole new look. And the formation of the embryo, all of that we talk about today in terms of Nadi Pariksha, comes out of the senses that are formed in these little embryos. We deliver the human body. Many years later, we develop the logic that we understand. And what is incredible here is that by the time we are about 60 days of this fetus, it, this fetus has more than 90% of all the identifiable structures. This is about four centimeters. In, in, in length, the entire logic that we are talking about and the mechanisms that are used, the senses that are used on the structures for the senses, the fingertips that we use are all formed in this embryo by week four. Now, within this are different rhythms. The space is divided, the rhythms are divided, there are things that are happening. 
all of that, respecting all this, the schematic shown here, all respecting the laws understood in the Indian traditional sciences, in the darshanas, in the siddhantas. We had Basavaraj presenting something about meridians. A lot of people doing Ayurveda will say, well, what is the connection between this Chinese system that we have and our pulse diagnosis? Sir, Basavaraj presents it very Actually, clearly. We have only three minutes, sir. He shows how these 12 meridians point to how the body is connected and how you can assess things. I feel there is a lot of possibility of cross-fertilization with those machines and understanding the Chinese representation of energies, the qi, as they call it, and the Indian representation of the tridoshas and prana. This is an entire uh, body for a whole new, not just a discussion, but a whole program of work that is worthy of many decades in the, in the future. And I hope people in places like IIT Mumbai and the different IITs in India will open up their minds and the minds of faculties and minds of students to engage in this space. We are all happy to note that Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU in New Delhi now has a program for Ayurvedic biology. I hope Sanjay Ji and Joshi Ji will enable these discussions with places like JNU so that we can start to have critical mass of teachers, critical mass of students, critical mass of minds who are conversant with all these areas. So understanding the human body, understanding the autonomic nervous system and how the different organs are connected, which is what you're doing in Nadi Pariksha. And what is it that we can learn from the skills that are there that uh, Sanjay Ji has brought together here how can we start to open dialogues? And I think it, it's, it's becoming very important that we do this because nobody else in the world has these skills and nobody else has a 